let me tell you a little bit of background on myself and how I uh, think that I'm somewhat qualified to stand up here and talk about both the Windows kernel and the Linux kernel. I've got a background in computer engineering. I've got an uh, undergraduate degree, a master's degree, and a PhD in computer engineering. My PhD is from Carnegie Mellon University, a school in the United States, where it, during my doctoral work, I actually was working on a flavor of Unix called BSD, running on top of the mock microkernel operating system. So my background through research and through school was on Unix. I came out of school and then started to work on the Windows platform. At, several years after I graduated, I went to IBM Research in the United States. And at IBM Research, I was hired specifically for my knowledge of Windows internals. But while I was there, I started to look at what was going on in the Linux side of things and becoming familiar with how the Linux kernel architecture is composed and its capabilities and became somewhat a Linux resource within IBM Research as well. In fact, there was uh, several years ago an underground effort within IBM to port Linux to the OS, to the S390 mainframe, and that's actually a project that started in Germany. Well, IBM at that point had to decide whether they wanted to commercialize this thing, what they wanted to do with this port of Linux, and so they formed a committee that would advised Lou Gerstner, who was the chairman of IBM at the time, as to what to do with this uh, version of Linux. And I was the technical Linux expert on that committee, which was composed of about eight or nine people and several people from marketing and other business groups within IBM. I also served as the Linux technical resource for the AIX, AIX division of IBM, AIX being IBM's version of Unix. And they, of course, were interested in what was going on with Linux when I was there. I'm no longer at IBM. But that just gives you a background in, in to how I started looking at Linux. I've been following the developments of Linux uh, for a long time. And the class that I'm going to give you today, or the session that I'm going to present to you today, is actually a session that I've asked for input from all the major players that it relates to. So for an example, David Cutler, who, as I'll tell you, is the chief architect of Windows NT and still works at Microsoft on the Windows kernel, he's reviewed the slides. Linus Torvalds has reviewed the slides, and I've had several other developers from the Windows team and from the Linux team review the slides and provide me their feedback. And I've incorporated all their feedback. At the end of the session, actually, I'm going to show you an email that I got from Linus as we were talking about the session where he points out the problems he has with, this, with what I'm going to tell you, and I'll address those, what he says then. So now, uh, this is the outline of the talk. And this is a very technical talk. So as, as well as getting a comparison of the two operating systems, I'm going to give you a heavy dose of Windows internals and Linux internals. But first, I'll start by talking about the evolution of the operating systems as they uh, progressed through time, when they were developed, when you, where you can trace the roots back to, and talk about where we are now with those operating systems. Then I'm going to take a very high-level look at the two architectures. Uh, and after that high-level look, dive in a little bit deeper and start to compare some of the kernel mode subsystems. So talk about how scheduling works on Linux, how it works on Windows, what's different, how memory manager is different, or and the same between the two OSs. And the section following that one, I'm going to talk about a number of features that I've seen go into Linux, a number of enhancements and capabilities that have been added to Linux over time that actually make it look a lot more like Windows in terms of Windows having had those same capabilities or features for a long time, now Linux progressively getting more and more of them, the two operating systems start out, started out looking kind of the same, which might be surprising to you as, you, as you'll see, and have actually evolved to look more and more the same from a kernel perspective. Then I'll talk about where we are in terms of the performance of the two kernels, because of course, kernels are designed to manage the resources of the computer and to manage them as efficiently as possible so the applications can perform as efficiently as possible. So in terms of saying what's a good kernel versus not a good kernel, you've got to talk about how applications can utilize the kernel services to do what they want to do. And one way that people measure that is through benchmarks. So I'm going to present to you the current state of the world in terms of benchmarks of Linux versus Windows. And then I'll spend a few minutes just pontificating if you'll indulge me, about where I think Linux is going, where I think Windows kernel is going, and what's the future hold. So let's start with, uh, before even I get into the history, talk, narrowing the scope. And in an hour and 15 minutes, I have a limited amount of time to even cover the material I'm covering. I certainly can't cover all the things that you might be interested 
in hearing about with respect to Linux versus Windows, including the cost, the total cost of ownership, how, how supportable the two OSs are, what kinds of applications are available for the two OSs, how manageable they are, and their use as a desktop system. Those are all outside the scope of this talk. And so I'm focusing just on kernel level technology. And I'll talk about where that fits into the big picture at the end of the talk. So if you look at Linux and try to figure out where it came from, you of course have to look back at the Unix operating system, which it's somewhat derived from. So in that sense, the real history of Linux starts in back in 1969 when Ken Thompson developed the first version of Unix at Bell Laboratories at AT&T. A few years later, Dennis Ritchie, who designed the C programming language, he's the father of C, he joined the project, and they both debuted in a joint paper to the academic community at a conference uh, in 1974, a paper on Unix. And Bell Labs, a couple years later, released the first commercial version, which was called Unix version 6. Well, Unix, uh, Bell Labs was pretty liberal about letting universities and companies license Unix source code and use it within organizations, and so it began to spread pretty fast. And in 1978, they actually released a version called the Unix Time Sharing System, which is a version with the source configured so that portability would be very easy. So it'd be easy for somebody to have said, hey, I want to take Unix and run it on this different kind of processor and port it. And that enhanced the proliferation as well. So because the source code was proliferated, people could license it, what you saw was three major branches of the Unix tree develop as companies started to add their own features and capabilities to Unix. And those three branches were Unix System 3 from Bell Labs' own Unix support group, another version called Unix BSD from University of California at Berkeley, and finally, believe it or not, Microsoft's own version of Unix, which was called Xenix. And if you're surprised that Microsoft had its own version of Unix, you might be even more surprised to know that it, if you look at the early 1980s and talk about the biggest Unix vendor in terms of units deployed around the world, that vendor was Microsoft. Now, what happened to Microsoft Xenix, and I think I just as a little sidebar, because it kind of brings us into current events, Microsoft Xenix was actually sold off to SCO. SCO was actually started with Microsoft Xenix. And the SCO group, Santa Cruz operation, uh, because Microsoft gave them Xenix, Microsoft took partial ownership of SCO, which Microsoft eventually sold off in the early 1990s. And now you know that if you've been following what's been going on in the U.S. with SCO, and SCO challenging the legitimacy of copyrights of various pieces of the Linux source code, and Microsoft, turns out, is funding indirectly SCO's operation in challenging Linux. It's kind of a, you know, it's, I kind of look at it as a father looking after a child that's gone off and trying to help them out after they've left the house. So the three branches continued to fragment even further. Those were the three major branches. You had lots of offshoots. There was a couple of efforts as the industry started to recognize that this, this diversity was going to cause a problem because you've got these vendors that put in special features into a version of Unix. Now you have applications that only work on that particular version of Unix. If the uh, user of Unix wanted to switch to a different version of Unix, well, then they'd be kind of stuck because their applications were coded to use those special features. And so two efforts were started to kind of define what would be the definition of Unix. And so hopefully application vendors would program to this definition of Unix, which all the major Unix variants would support, and you'd have cross-platform portability. Those two efforts were, one was IEEE POSIX, which released a standard API interface for Unix, and another one was the XOpen Group's portability guide, which also defined the way the services that Unix operating systems should make available to applications. Well, even though those portability guides were released, you still saw a lot of fragmentation in Unix, and you still see that today. So let's pick up now where Linus comes into play. In 1991, Linus took a college computer science course that used a toy operating system called Minix that was modeled after, or that is modeled, it's still available, it's modeled after Unix. It's a very stripped down, basic, bare bones version of Unix that's uh, simple enough so that a university student can understand it from top to bottom in one semester. Fits on a floppy disk, it's that small. And Linus, after taking the course, was thrilled with this access to the source code for this thing and how he th thinking how he could make it better and make it portable, make it run on a whole bunch of different op, uh, platforms. And he approached 
Andrew Tannenbaum, who's the author of the tool and the author of the textbook that Linus was working off of. Andrew Tenenbaum, by the way, lives here in Amsterdam. He's not here right now. I invite, invited him to this class. Actually, he is on, on a trip in the US, unfortunately. But in any case, Linus contacted Andrew and said, Andrew, you know, I think your Minix operating system is really pretty cool. How about if I take it and I make it better? And Andrew said, flat out said, no, I'm not going to allow you to do that because I want to keep this thing as simple as possible so that university students can understand it. If you start to go add to it, it won't be teachable in one semester class. So Linus, discouraged, went off on his own and started to make his own version of a Unix-like operating system. He, in October 1991, he, he announced Linux version 0 0.2, and in March 90, 1994, he released version 1.0, so the first big version. Let's turn our attention now to Windows NT talk about its history. And if you look at the history of Windows NT, you've got to even go back further than the original release, back to Digital, the company that used to be Digital, where in the mid-1970s, uh, three people architected an operating system for Digital called VMS. And those three people were Dick Husbett, Peter Lippmann, and David Cutler. That v, uh, the VMS operating system was targeted at Digital's 32-bit VAX processor, and Digital shipped the first version in 1978 right around the time the first version of Unix was released. Well, so David Cutler moved to Seattle in the late 1980s and opened a development facility there called DeckWest that was going to work on a new operating system called Mica for a new CPU codenamed Prism. And that the work that came out of Prism actually ended up part of it in the alpha processor. But the project was canceled after a couple of years. So David Cutler, being somewhat discouraged, was kind of looking around at other opportunities. And that's where Microsoft comes into play. Bill Gates, seeing that Dave was probably disenchanted with digital, invited him over. And conveniently, he was just down the street, invited him to a meeting, and hired Cutler and 20 engineers from the Deck West facility. In fact, some of those were hardware engineers. So that's where the Microsoft hardware division actually sprang from, is the fact that Microsoft had these hardware people from digital that they needed to find something to do. Well, this new project that Bill had assigned Dave to work on was called NTOS2, New Technology OS2. It was New Technology OS2 because Microsoft was partner, good partners then with IBM and wanted to make a robust version of the OS2 operating system that they would own. Well, in 1990, Microsoft released Windows 3.0, which was the first really successful version of the Windows 16-bit operating system. It just had a huge uh, popularity as it was released. And so Microsoft and Bill Gates specifically said, hey, why don't we m forget this partnership with IBM and let's go do this thing. Let's focus on Windows. And so the project was renamed Windows NT. That was going to be the primary inter operating system interface that would be supported as a, a new version of the Windows API that was supported by Windows 3.1. And Microsoft released Windows NT 3.1. The version number was made to coincide with the current version of the 16-bit Windows operating system, which was 3.1, in August of 1993. So if you look at a timeline of the evolution of these two operating systems, starting with their predecessors, you see that they have both had their birth back in the mid-1970s. And they both now have uh, had their orig origins back in the mid-1970s. They both had their birth in the early 1990s. And they've been evolving pretty quickly since then. And my point in showing you this is that the two operating systems, as I'm going to show you in this presentation, are very similar from a kernel perspective. And that's not, I think, an accident. It's because of their common evolution in time. As people, are, uh, engineers work on